The Parkland shooting has ignited conversation about the power of the NRA and the strategic path forward, especially for the Democratic Party. Here to help us make sense of it all is Beisel Smykel. He's a Democratic strategist and the former executive director of the New York State Democratic Party. Thank you so much for being with Good us. To be here. I'm Thank happy you. To. So, in the last few days, in the wake of the Parkland shooting, we've seen um, a level of protest and outrage that, although the United States has become, I don't want to say accustomed, but maybe inured to mass shootings, right. uh, that seems to have changed the discussion or at least provoked a different discussion. Do you think that there really is a way forward for real change at this point? Is this really going to move the needle? I'm skeptical of it in part because I thought something would change substantially after the shooting in Connecticut of those young children. Sandy Hook. And when, when those families were at uh, the White House with President Obama standing with him and there seemed to be this outpouring of uh, emotion on multiple sides, I thought something was going to be done then. And consider the fact that members of Congress have been touched by this too. Members were shot in a congressional baseball game yes. just a couple months ago, and Gabby Gifford several years ago. If nothing substantial has been done then, especially when it's attacking uh, members of Congress themselves, I'm skeptical that we will have real movement uh, in, in with this particular uh, shooting. Sad as that is, I'm skeptical. So t let's talk then about how uh, members of Congress, representatives, state legislators are boxed in around the issue of gun control. Because that's really what you're saying, is that politically they are unable to move. It's very difficult for them because they have, number one, taken a tremendous amount of support from the NRA. In fact, the NRA in this last presidential election spent more money than they ever have in this election, um, in the in 2016 cycle. Um, and even a state like New York, which is reliably blue, it's only voted for a Republican president six times since the Great Depression. When you leave New York City and you go upstate New York, um, the gentleman in the previous segment notwithstanding, there are a number of people who really do cling to their guns as part of their culture. So it's going to be difficult to eradicate, but the question is, can we get members to uh, feel comfortable with a vote for substantial con gun control? And if they don't get uh, enough of a... Uh, of s financial support to keep their office if they make that vote, um, they're not going to side with gun control activists. They're going to side with, uh, with the NRA. So let's just parse that out a little bit. So if um, what you're saying is that the, the NRA clearly has dollars, clearly sure. spends those dollars, those dollars sure. are very powerful and they mm -hmm. talk on behalf of that lobby. I'm thinking if, if you're a legislator in um, elected in a in maybe a purple state that mm -hmm. has a high percentage of gun ownership mm -hmm. um, and maybe a stronger attachment to a conservative interpretation of the Second Amendment, mm -hmm. how do you help move your community forward on the issue of how do you strategize? What's your strategy if you personally really believe that there has to be change? Well, if you're, if you, whether you've seen this incident or previous incidents and it's gotten you to the point of saying we need some real change here, then I think you have to make the argument first and foremost that Democrats, which the president has made, Democrats are not trying to take away your guns. In fact, there are more guns bought during the Obama administration than ever before. Democrats are not trying to take away your guns. What we're saying is that we need to have meaningful gun laws and very strict gun laws that not just prevent movement from state to state, but prevent who actually gets them. It was Donald Trump that rolled back measures for the mentally ill uh, to, to prevent yes. them from getting uh, weapons. An Obama era um, An Obama regulation. era uh, uh, regulation. And so we need to, A, we need to put that back, number one. Number two, I mean, there are real, there. we should treat it more as a privilege. Probably more regulations around being able to drive and maintain a car than there are to be able to get in and maintain a, a gun. And I think if we, if we, if we make the case that we're not trying to take away your guns. We're actually just trying to make it so that if you have one, we know that you are going to use it safely and responsibly. But in this country, driving a car may be a privilege, but owning a gun is a right. That's true, And but think about it this way. Uh, the United States is 3% of the world's population. We own 42% of the guns in this world. It's like a natural resource. Um, right. The fact that that is the case, there is a, there is a real problem with that. Why, I don't mind you having a gun, but why do you need a military-style weapon? This young man was 19 years old, had a $2,500 military assault, military-grade assault rifle. Why is that necessary for him? So when you look at what um, the governor of Florida has mm -hmm. done today, I mean, he is an A-plus mm -hmm. NRA Absolutely. ranking. 
Florida for decades has done nothing to advance gun control policy, as a matter of fact, has gone in quite the opposite direction. The NRA is quite possibly one of the most, well, it is one of the most powerful lobby groups in Tallahassee. And when you see the steps that he has taken mm -hmm. to date, not yet passed into law, but he has proposed, does that give you a, any sense that perhaps the dialogue around this is changing? I think it's, it's, it's a step in the right direction, but he's also term limited. And so when you have, uh, if, there are, if you think about uh, Bob Corker and others who have decided to retire and they've used that opportunity to stand up against this administration, maybe you have individuals that are able to do this because they feel they have nothing to lose. And if that's what we have to cling to, then perhaps that's the right way um, to go. You, I mean, you're right. Governor Scott cannot run for governor, governor again, but he says he's going to run for a Senate seat, which is currently held by a Democrat. Right. And, you know, and so maybe he's looking at this as something that will jog him should he decide to, 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 to make that move. And look, at, I think that for the young people that are out there marching and, and, and mobilizing, I mean, this is, a, this is a constituency that I think he feels he can pick up. Um, but it's a move in the right direction. I won't take that from him. Thank you, Basil. We'll be back talking with you more later in the program. Students in the Parkland shooting have galvanized young people to be more engaged in the political process. However, there is still plenty of apathy and misunderstanding of how government works. Back with us is Basil Smikel, adjunct professor at Columbia University in Wallace Ford, chair of the Public Administration Department at Megar Egbers College. You're both professors. <laughs> I mean, how, um, how aware or how tuned into the process are your students? How much do they understand? Well, you know, I always go back to right after the president won in uh, 2016, the first, uh, first couple of months in 2017 when Donald Trump signed executive orders. Uh, my students were like, can he do that? And I said, yes, of course he can. Those are the powers of the presidency. So I think what's happened now since then, um, especially now, is uh, students are making the connection between politics and governance. And that's so important for them because now they actually understand how just getting someone elected and the powers of that individual once they get to that office, and it gives them a greater sense of the accountability of, uh, of being an elected. Well, you know, I can, I can tell you, the, on no November 9th, the day, the morning after the election, we had a town hall meeting at Medgar's College, and mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people weren't very ha happy, as you can imagine. But one of the things, and I talked to our president, uh, Dr. Crew, Rudolph Crew, about this, I said one of the lessons, the takeaway, and this is what Basil is talking about here, is civic literacy. Mm -hmm. People don't understand, did not understand, why elections are important. You heard so many people saying it doesn't matter who's president um, yes. and all these kinds <laughs> of actions. Yeah. And, and, it um, does. <laughs> and, and, and it really goes to a larger lesson of civic literacy. And since that day, November 9th, we've worked very hard to now make uh, our introductory courses on uh, public administration available to all of our incoming students and freshman students. So even if you're going to be a math major or a bio major or a doctor or whatever you want to be, you need to understand how government works. Mm -hmm. And the people who do understand it obviously are the ones that are typically going to be more successful mm -hmm. in, in, in uh, advancing their agenda. You know, earlier in this program I was talking to both of you about two very different topics about gun control and about the Mueller investigation, Russian interference in the 20, 2016 election. And both of those are very dense, they're complex. Mm -hmm. You have to ha understand layers of layers of nuance, really. It's not even layers of, you have to have layers of nuance. Right. So if you talk about, um, say, the gun control debate with your, with your students, what are the things that you need to make sure that they understand about that discussion? First and foremost, the law. Um, right. What does the Second Amendment say? There's a comma here, is a comma there. What does that mean if you parse that, right? And, and what it doesn't say. And what it doesn't say. And, um, and the next thing is a real good understanding about culture. Culture is very important because, you know, as I, I was saying before, if you're in New York City, by and large, it's six to one Democrat to Republican in the city, and more people than not will support gun control. But when you travel an hour north, it's a very different story. The culture is very different. Much of upstate New York could look like Kansas or Iowa, and those families feel very differently about guns. So it's incumbent upon them to understand uh, that there are more there are people that think differently from them, and to step out of that bubble a little bit and right. actually get a, be a greater understanding of the environment that they're and, in. And, and the other point is the Second Amendment has been around for 230 years. Yeah. Yes. But it's only been in the last 40, 50 years that we've had this just this firestorm of debate about not about who can own just own a gun. 
because that's not been the, that's not the issue. And one could argue that the Second Amendment may not even doesn't even say that. But what you had is the commercialization of the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that it's not enough just to have a gun. You need to have this kind of gun. And I would now, and, you know, automatic weapons weren't in the conversation just 30, 40 years right. ago. But now they are. And that's where the real danger is. I understand it as it was Basil said. If, if I lived on a farmhouse in the middle of um, you know some countryside, yeah, I might want to have. Uh, you know, sure. some type of weapon or something like that, and if, and if I yeah, was into hunting and all that, that's been around for a long time. What we're seeing now is is people in the suburbs, people in the cities, with with the, just this, is the commercialization of the Second Amendment mm -hmm. that that is our real problem right now. Well, w one of the th one of the major factors in American politics, probably more so than the politics of any other nation, is money. Mm -hmm. And wh when you're talking about an issue like weapons like gu and like gun control, mm -hmm. there is a lot of money. The NRA is an enormously wealthy lobby association for gun manufacturers. Mm -hmm. There is now some money, not similarly sized money, but there is now some money on the other side of the debate. How important is it that your students understand the role that money plays in the American political process? Uh, I talk about money a lot because, it, particularly when you're dealing with presidential, citywide or statewide elections, money is viability. It's the first primary, as we say. Sure. And so uh, we talk about how important money is, but we also talk about how individual donors have an opportunity to control the narrative, not only of the individual they're supporting, but of people perhaps on the other side of that of that race. And so they react to it and say, why should there be so much money in a race? And having done this work, I understand it's for TV, it's for mail, it's for staff, that there are real reasons why you need money, but the fact that in the Obama years, and it's not just him, but it's in the Obama years, we spent billions of dollars on political campaigns. That is an obscene amount of money. Um, and and they, they are starting to re reject the notion that money should be uh, so much a part of our process. So I'm teaching a constitutional law course right now, and one of the things we try to do is connect the Constitution to current events. There's been two Supreme Court decisions just yes. in the last few years, the McCulloch case and the Citizens United case, which mm -hmm. basically say, I can give as much money as I want to whomever I want. I don't even need to tell you who, it, who I am or what it's about. And of course, th this, this obscures um, the, is the notion of what free elections even mean. Yeah, it is. It is interesting that um, while while we have all this money going into uh, the the campaign process, we also have this other aspect of voter suppression taking place in a very real way, making it less easy and more difficult for people to vote. And um, in many countries, for example, they, they vote on the weekends. Real simple thing. Right. right. Okay. So you don't have to take time off from work. You can vote online. Right. You can do a number of things which people say, no, no, no. We want to do it the same way we did it in 1875. Why? <laughs> you know, and and. Why the why is because you're looking at a change, a shift in in just the the demographics of this country, where the people who have the most money may not be the most people. Okay, and so all that they've got left is the money and voter suppression to try and maintain their um, their viability, yeah. and that's not going to last. Well, thanks, buddy. Wallace Ford, Basil Smichael, thanks so much for pleasure. having My that pleasure, conversation. As Thank Absolutely. you. Thanks.